Hello friends, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for clicking play. This week we have Rakesh Rootsman Rack, who is an activist, reggae DJ and bona fide permaculture expert. This conversation covers Rakesh's definition of permaculture and how we might go about implementing this as part of our daily lives. At its essence, permaculture is a holistic approach to living in accordance to our needs. And I'm sure by, by now, you guys are, know that I'm pulled by holistic perspectives. This podcast is a light intro into a way of living that is becoming more and more popular as people search for their deeper needs to be met, be that physical, emotional, spiritual, and mental, or mental. I had the pleasure of taking part in one of Rakesh's workshops two years ago, and it was a special, special time. A true bonding experience that went far beyond horticulture tips. To learn more about Rakesh and his upcoming workshops in Ireland, check out the links below. Thanks to Rakesh and thanks to you for listening. All the best. Rakesh, Rootsman Rack, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? Very good, thanks. Yep, enjoying life. Uh, There's lots of really fascinating things happening. So, yeah, very good, thank you. And what's the crack? How have you been recently? I know it's been a difficult time for everyone, but thing, things are looking up. And yeah, so how, how's that period been for you? So, for me personally, it's been really good for the simple reason that uh, I I was doing a course on community on um, holistic life design. So it's all about how to understand our uh, inner and outer worlds and how to find that kind of balance between our mental physical and spiritual realms looking at our physical body and how to really enrich and you know um yeah how to really treat our body like it was a machine and how to make it work really in an optimal way and how to understand our you know our physical mental and spiritual well-being and how to find this balance and so We've kind of learnt about naturopathy. We learnt about um, uh, uh, yeah, certain tantric processes, and we learnt and we put it all through a permaculture design. So I pretty much redesigned my life in terms of how I could really work in a really beautiful, optimal way. And as soon as that ended, like the day before it, the course itself ended, we switched the internet back on, and all of a sudden, pandemic and all the borders are starting to close and it's like wow okay so it took me a week to get back home to england i got stuck in paris and when i got home obviously i had to self-isolate and no problem i just moved into what was my parents house which had been abandoned for seven years and i created a forest garden there for them when they were alive and pretty much for the next two weeks, it was so easy to self-isolate because I just had loads and loads of food in my garden. And then for the next two, three months, uh, I never had bothered. I went, I looked, you know, kind of cycled past some shops, saw all these queues. It's like, no, I'm not queuing. No, I don't need anything that desperately to have to queue up to go to a shop. So for the next two, three months, I pretty much never went to any shops and just ate from my garden. And so it was great, you know, really good quality, healthy food. And uh, pretty much uh, I recognised that other people were kind of not in as good a position as me, you know, in terms of food. Um, and so I started teaching online, started saying, hey, uh, let's, you know, uh, we started like a public skill share so that we could share some of our skills with people, uh, which we call Roots and Resilience. And then I started running workshops. All right, you want to grow food? Uh, Because obviously at that time, as soon as the pandemic hit, everyone started to try buy seeds. All of the um, online seed retailers, their websites crashed. They couldn't supply them as many seeds as they needed. So people were struggling even to get seeds. And I'm like, well, just take cuttings, just perennial foods. Like, why are you you chasing after all these seeds? Just uh... and so I pretty much just kicked kicked off straight away and just started teaching people about how to grow food in a low maintenance way Uh, so you know yeah obviously at that time people had plenty of time so you could invest the time in designing your garden 
uh, but then long term when you do go back to work you don't have to worry about it because it just keeps growing it just keeps giving you food so yeah so it was great so just being able to do that and showing people and watching people as they they really start to thrive in this way was yeah it was fantastic so yeah i loved it delighted to hear delighted to hear that you can utilize the, the time in, in such a way i you mentioned perennial plants i before we get getting into perennials and what you have in your forest garden and what exactly mm-hmm. is a forest garden uh, it would be great if you could let the listeners know what is permaculture uh, and <laughs> yeah how, how did you come across it okay so how did i come across it so uh, at that particular time i so most of my life i've been i've had access to a garden a small back garden and you know uh, i was always getting most of my medicines and things from there and growing some food whatever i could as and when i could so i always had some kind of a connection but i then also studied in fact the only thing i've actually really studied in life was uh, homeopathy so I got a really good understanding of the body and medicine and how the mind works and various things like that. And I was working as a computer consultant, earning very good money. And, you know, at the point at which I kind of got myself and my family out of poverty and into a place where we were actually comfortable, I then wanted to start giving something back to the world. So I started doing charity work as a homeopath. And so most of my life was either teaching, was uh, either working in computers, earning money, and then going around the world, either setting up disaster relief camps or teaching people how to prepare for disaster and things like that. So, and then occasionally go and do like a little reggae tour. I'm also a reggae DJ. So, so life was a mixture of, you know, working, earning money, spending that money to go and set up clinics and teach people how to really look after their health and things and a little bit of reggae here and there. And then on one of these tours, I ended up in Croatia, uh, met a girl and she just asked me a question, well, why would you want to go back to England? Hmm, good question. Had no answer, so I stayed. And... um and at that time, not long after, was a, a big tsunami. So I started packing my bags to go off to, you know, to go and do some disaster relief work. And, uh, yeah, I wasn't allowed to. I was basically told, oh, you, so you're going to go off to a, a dangerous country where millions of people are homeless, but you're more likely, because it's so lawless, to be mugged and robbed by the police than you are from the millions of people who are uh you know uh who are you know homeless etc and there's no way i know whether you're dead or alive and i was like well i wouldn't have put it like that but yeah that's what i'm intending to do and she wouldn't let me so i had to kind of re redesign my life what what else is it that i want to do and the one thing i really wanted to do was build my own house grow my own food and so we started looking for some land just and i met various i went to see various eco villages and while i was there many people kept saying wow you should teach us some of this stuff what do you mean me teach you you should be teaching me you're living in an eco village yeah yeah but you understand this really well come on that's just common sense though you know you've built a house you've got a veranda on the north side of a house which is never going to get sun and then you're surprised that it's cold that, that that's just common sense you know um and the fact that you've planted those really sun loving things in between two buildings so it only gets sun you know right in the middle of the day and the rest of the time it's you know it, it's common sense that it won't grow so um one thing led to another they then asked me if i could organize a course on natural building and so i brought someone over and during this course this person, everything they said is like, come on, that's just common sense. You don't really need to teach people that, do you? Like, that's just, like, obvious. And everything he, he said was just really, as I say, obvious to me. And during this process, he mentioned the word permaculture a few times. And um, so I then asked him, what is permaculture? And the way he explained it, it's like, well, yeah, it's just common sense. Um, 
And then people said, wow, let's do a permaculture course then. So I organised someone to come over to do a permaculture course. And again, everything that, um, that was mentioned was really obvious, was really common sense. And so not being, you know, uh, I don't know how, yeah, I mean, for me it was just really obvious because I came from a background of hardship and having to solve problems. And so my attitude to how to solve problems, as you start, you know, doing things and it doesn't work, you then try it in a different way and it does work and then you realise, ah, it works because of this. And it worked. So that practical approach to actually doing things is what led me to really understand permaculture deeply. And I guess permaculture for me, my definition for permaculture now is permaculture is just common sense, but in a world where sense is no longer common, meaning that if you've got common sense, you don't need permaculture. But if you have been educated in the way that many people have been educated in this world, you lose sight of that common sense and you start making decisions that go against the grain of uh, what is really rich for yourself, for your surroundings, for other people, etc, etc. And so... Can you give us an example, Rakesh, where... So I, I can give you like an, a slightly different perspective of, of uh, poem cultures. So it's <clears throat> it's about creating designs, about intentionally designing how you meet your human needs in a way that is, as I say, it meets your needs but it also meets the needs of other people. It enriches other people's lives. But not that just that, but it also enriches your surroundings, i.e. nature, the environment. So it's all about intentionally designing systems that meet your needs, but also meet the needs of everyone else and everything else. So it's about, it's an ethical design approach. So if you're growing food, for example, how can you grow food in a way that rather than um, trying to destroy other animals and insects and protect your plants from them and deprive them of their ability to really thrive on this planet? And as we know, one of the major challenges that we face right now, is not just global warming or climate change, but it's um, biodiversity loss, you know, one million species going to go extinct in the next, uh, in our lifetimes because of our human activities. And this attitude that when I grow my food, no one else, nothing else is allowed to touch it. No animals, no insects. I want to protect myself uh, because it's all for me, me only. This kind of selfish attitude then leads to you actually doing so much extra work. Um, Whereas if you work with nature and actually allow nature to bring in nutrients, to recycle nutrients, and if you have to feed them a little bit, some of your produce, so what? So what? It actually encourages life and it actually enriches your environment. It creates an environment that then allows more things to actually grow. So my garden, for example, uh, that I designed for my parents. I designed it very intentionally to design work out of the system because as they were getting older, they really enjoyed the garden, they enjoyed nature, they enjoyed watching, you know, different animals, birds, squirrels, whatever, run through the system and fly through the system. But every time they would dig, they'd be like, oh, complaining for a week about all the aches and, you know, and so how do I design work out of it? You design work out by allowing nature to do the work instead. And so I designed the system so nature would com completely take over and do all of the work. But again, it's about design, putting the right things in the right place so we get the yields we want, but nature also gets what she needs and it enriches the space. So, uh, yeah, so it's this ethical approach to enriching all of our spaces so all of us have our lives enriched.
not just us as human beings, but all nature, all bacteria, insects, animals, you know, and another byproduct is obviously, you know, um, cleaning the air, um, you know, encouraging, um, you know, in, in drier parts of the world, it actually can encourage rainfall where it's really necessary. Uh, it's, you know, there's so many benefits to to growing food in this particular way. So, yeah, so permaculture is, well, originally it started off predominantly as being a food growing system, but because the ethical approach and the design process is so clean, it's so clear, we can actually use it to design almost anything. So we can use it to design all of our human needs. So our mental, physical, as well as, you know, food needs. Rakesh, for people who are living in the cities, I would imagine about 90, 95% of the people listening are, and that they like they like the sound of what you're saying. They they would like to rely less on, on, on shops for their food. They would like to think more holistically about their health and more ethically about uh, what they're growing around in the natural environment. What what would you say are first steps? So as I say, so permaculture can be used to design almost anything. And so where we would start is by starting to look at what some of your human needs are. So you need food, shelter, you know, health, etc., etc. Um, but then there's the more kind of subtle things, which for me is really important and it's quite easy to overlook is to think about our our mental and spiritual well-being and so part of that is uh you know we are a pack animal you know we 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 for billions of years as we've evolved we've designed to live in packs in um in groups to support each other and so on and so forth the modern way of thinking about you know survival of the fittest and uh, that we must all compete against each other is so against the grain of who and what we actually are and and so thinking about how we can connect with other people how we can uh, get our needs met by being in groups and how others can benefit from our skills and our abilities and how we can share things with others and and just once we start designing in this way you'll see that you know your sense of self-worth all of a sudden really like wow so wow this person really loves the fact that I know how to sew and and when I started teaching them how to mend their trousers just the joy on their face wow that was so beautiful you know, and I thought, what, what do I really know? I can't really do anything. All I can do is, you know, and many people really, because most of society is designed in such a way that we define ourselves by what we're trained to do and what we do as a job. And all these more subtle skills uh, are almost devalued. So we don't feel like we have anything to offer, but actually we all have something really magic to offer. So when we start working, in, when we start getting groups together, we do what we call like a community asset map. So we get to, to people to think about what are the things that uh, you're really passionate about. What was it? Okay, you may be passionate about football. Okay, you may be passionate about cycling. You may be passionate about... I don't know, food growing, you may be, pa- it doesn't matter, what is, what is it you're passionate about? You may be passionate about reading. You know, for me as a dyslexic who I really struggle to read, someone who can, hey, dude, read this book for me, just tell me what it's about afterwards. Fantastic, then I don't have to read. Like, come on, what, you know, you love reading, so just read this book for me, tell me what it's about. Then I get the knowledge, you get the joy of reading, everyone's happy. So, um... So no matter what skill you think you have, no matter how insignificant it may be, for someone else, you know, for someone, for example, who uh, is hard of hearing or who is blind or who is, has mobility issues, someone with those most, you know, uh, with those abilities, 
all of a sudden you become a godsend, you become, you know, really valuable. And so, how do we find these things out? So, yeah, we look at what people are passionate about, we look at what things um, uh, people can actually make, physically make, and what are the things people know intellectually. So it's hands, heart and head, head, hands and heart. Um, so we collect all of these and we kind of cluster them together and, you know, just do this with 10 people. And you see the incredible amount of skills within those 10 people. Imagine if those 10 people came together and started working together. We could do anything, anything. And this is just 10 people. Imagine if you've got access to 500 people. You know, so we have the skills. And so this is the starting point is unlocking those skills and allow and giving people an opportunity to share them, to be able to, yeah, to, to really enrich each other's lives. It's a very important message, Rakesh, because I think people really need to hear that. I think, like you said, people do feel quite useless. They're, it's almost like the overarching um, the overarching feeling is that what we're doing is not enough or it doesn't really feed us. It doesn't really seem like there are a lot of people appreciating what we're doing. And like you said, it, uh, literally, there's someone on your street that would appreciate the things that you're good at, that maybe you, the things you're good at you don't value. You know, like you said, uh, um, uh, I know how to I, I know how to play records. You know, a lot of pe people don't know how to put records, and maybe someone down the street that would love to know how to do that. A little bit on plants, a little bit on this, and even I remember, full disclosure, I took I was a participant in one of Rakesh's permaculture courses two years ago. It was a fantastic experience, but uh, I remember, I think we talked about the idea of. The, the, our accumulation as well as in I remember we talked about how why do why does everyone on the corn like, why does everyone in our street have to have a hoover or, or a vacuum cleaner when really we use the vacuum cleaner like I don't know once a week once every few days and surely we could just pop into the neighbor and go can I use that hoover on Saturday at 10 a.m. and can I use it at Sunday at 6 p.m. and I remember I came home after this experience and our, and our vacuum cleaner stopped working. And for a few weeks, it was magical. I would just pop into my neighbor and go, here, can I use your, uh, can I use your vacuum cleaner? Say, yeah, no problem. And it was like, <laughs> I, like I think that you're also mentioning that you're just building more connection. You're realizing that there was a need for me to be closer to my neighbors, to be closer than the people that I share a street with or share a community with. And, um, but interestingly, after a few weeks, you know, my dad was uncomfortable with it because my dad grew up in a different generation. And my dad was like, oh, well, like, so we can't be dependent on the neighbor. We have to get our own over, you know? <laughs> and, and it was almost like a coming together of, um, of ideologies, if you will, you know, because I think my dad's generation are quite uh, conscious of pride of not being, you know, dependent on other people. Whereas, mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, what you're talking about is a kind of, pride in the fact that we do depend on the community and I do depend on my neighbor for this but he depends on me for that and that gives me meaning mm -hmm. exactly exactly so take pride in your community as opposed to individual pride um, what's that saying pride comes before a fall and all that so um, you know so if you're really struggling you know maybe you know if you're struggling I don't know to meet some of your nutritional needs and your neighbor has something growing in their garden that will absolutely benefit you but you can't afford to go out and buy this something or whatever or you don't have it growing uh, and but your pride stops you from asking your neighbor can I just have a nibble of your whatever you know because uh, it's really going to help my health that pride is going to kill you you know okay maybe I can thought of a different example but um, but the fact is, you know, that uh, to cut ourselves off from each other because we live in this paradigm which says that we are all independent, we are all separate, we must all survive on our own because of our own skills in our own way and um, 
and that we can't rely on anybody else actually creates so much separation. It creates so much stress because, all right, so the one thing I'm really not good at is uh, is bookkeeping and doing my things like my tax returns. That is the most stressful time of my year. I can do anything else. I can build you a house. I can make you electricity. I can grow food. I can make medicine. But doing my tax returns, oh my God, it's so stressful. So if someone in my community could do the tax returns for me, oh, I'd be so happy, you know. Um... So it's that kind of thing, you know, and, you know, yeah, and like, sure, I can help you grow food in your back garden, you know, sure, I can help uh, other people to do whatever they want to do, you know, I'm happy to offer these things to others. And, okay, going back to your scenario, if you were just continuously um, just borrowing things from everybody else, but never giving anything back to them, then there's a, an imbalance there. But if you're saying, hey, but, you know, I've got a record player. If you want to come and let's have a party once in a while, you know, um, or I've actually got, you know, this and, you know, and if you need to borrow a, a lawnmower or something or a scythe to, to cut your garden instead of a lawnmower, I've got that, you know. So if you don't want to be using electricity to cut your, you know, if you want to be more environmentally friendly and you want to cut down on some of these things, I've actually got a really good site. Oh, you don't know how to use it. Ah, oh, I can show you. Ah, oh, it's really, ah, oh, it's really beautiful. It's a really lovely motion. Keeps you fit and healthy. And, you know, you cut the grass in such a way that it'll grow back really so much stronger. And it doesn't kill animals and da, 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 da. And it's so many benefits to doing it for yourself and for the environment. I'd happily show you how to do that because I, yeah. And so this kind of exchange. Now, if it's just a one-way thing, take, 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 then that's imbalanced. But if we're offering things in exchange and, you know, and everyone knows that they can just knock on each other's doors when they need things. In fact, there's, um, here in London, there's a project called uh, a Library of Things, where uh, quite literally, you know, it's a library of things, whatever, lawnmowers and step ladders and whatever, you know, all these commodities and then the the you know so people donate them and then there's teams of people who upkeep them make sure that they and if they break they fix them and so on and so forth so it's um you know so you always have products that things that you can borrow um that are well kept and they're kept by the community for the community so yeah and just in doing that, as say, just the conversations that happen, the connections that happen. Um, another thing that very typically happens in many of these kind of community projects, you know. So, for example, uh, during one particular permaculture course, funny enough, in Ireland, uh, there was a discussion about, because um, at that point, the majority of people still lived in rural conditions. But it was getting, you know, the trend was that, yeah, in the next 10, 15 years, and we've actually just passed this point, now more people live in urban environments than they do in rural environments. And so this is a worldwide statistic. It's just, we've just passed that. So as they were teaching permaculture, they were thinking, well, you know, how come it's it's always the same beardy weirdies who turn up at permaculture courses? You know, it's... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, quite literally, and um, and you know, it, we're pretty much preaching to the converted. Why isn't it we? Why aren't we attracting people from towns and cities? Whereas you know, that's where it's actually really going to be needed soon. Well, actually, already needed. So how could we make permaculture more attractive to people living in cities? So they actually made a design, and they actually called this design a transition town. And so they started a new movement called Transition Towns. And so it's how do you bring the kind of permaculture ethics, you know, the permaculture ethics being earth care, you know, really taking care of the earth. In whatever it is you do, are you enriching your surroundings? Are you making the world around you better for different animals and insects? Or are you depleting it, destroying it, poisoning it, etc.? So does it you know so earth care the most fundamental part of permaculture the first ethic then it's about people care are you really enriching people's lives by doing whatever it is you're designing or are you de 
depleting people? Are you exploiting people? Are you depriving people of their ability to really thrive? And that includes people you know, people you don't know, even includes future generations. So if you're living in a way that is consuming, 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 and you can see very clearly that future generations will not have the ability to be able to thrive in the world because you're taking up all of their resources, again, this is not permaculture. So Earth Care, People Care and Fair Share is about um, yeah, only taking out of the system what the system can genuinely give you so that you, so you meet your needs, but you only take what you need. The rest you share. You either share it with other people, you share it with surroundings, or you reinvest it back into the system so the system becomes richer and stronger and more resilient. So this is the most fundamental part of permaculture. So when we're making our designs, this is always kind of the top of whatever we do, whether it's working with people, whether it's working with the land. It's about making designs that truly enrich the world in you know, every aspect of our surroundings. And Rakesh, what if there's people listening and say, I like the idea of this, maybe I could um, start growing some carrots in my back garden, or maybe I could do this, but I, I, I really, I don't have the time. Mm -hmm. Would your argument be that really this is a huge time saver, long term, this approach? So... The fact is that uh, if you talk to most people about annual vegetable growing, so carrots, potatoes, tomatoes and things like that, it does take a lot of time and energy. There will be a certain amount of failures, you know, um, and that could be demoralizing. And, you know, you know, just as you put your tomatoes out because, you know, right, there's not going to be any more frosts for this, you know. And then all of a sudden, a week later, the frost comes, kills all of your tomatoes, and it's like, oh, start again. So there's a lot of, it's very hit and miss, and it takes a lot of skill to actually do annual veg growing. And then you have to do all over again next year, and then again next year, and then again next year. So it's this continuous work. So instead, I concentrate more on using perennial plants. And what that means is they're plants which, once you plant them, they will come back on their own the next year and the year after and the year after. Some perennials can be like eight, ten years. So I've got certain cabbages that give me yield, that give me leaves all year round, even in the winter, even in when it's snowing. Uh, you know, in the snow, they, they wilt a little bit and they look a little bit sad. But then as soon as the, you know, the snow melts, they start to grow again. And so they last maybe eight years and others could last thousands of years. Many fruit trees can live, you know, two, three hundred years. Uh, others can live even up to thousands of years. So uh, using perennial plants uh, for food, A means that uh, you don't, you typically don't hardly need to water them. You hardly need to add nutrients to them. You hardly need to do any work to keep it going. Your main job is just harvesting and being a bit more creative in how you cook some of these things. So it takes a little while to learn how to do this. But, um, you know, I run, uh, I run courses and typically in eight well, I, I, it's something like 10, 12 half day sessions, four hour sessions. I get people to the point where they've actually started to implement and started to get their, their systems implemented. So it takes a little while, takes some effort. But if you put that effort in at the beginning and then the implementation, typically, if you're looking at a back garden, it could take you two days to implement the majority of it. And then maybe four or five days in the next few years to to keep you know to keep adjusting and doing a few extra things as the system grows and so for about 10 days work over five years you've got a food growing system that will just keep growing year after year after year after year and while people at the beginning may find this uh unbelievable or maybe there's a better word i could use for that yeah um unrealistic but when I tell people, actually, the hardest job that you're going to have in 10 years time 
is try to think what to do with all this food. Um, and, and it's really funny, one of my, someone who's who studied with me and uh, is now also teaching with me, she's, she's absolutely fantastic, uh, she actually wrote a post very recently exactly that, saying, yeah, I, I didn't believe it at the beginning that, that we would be in this position, but now I'm scratching my head, what on earth am I going to do with all this food? Uh, I've, I've made so many pickles and preserved it in this way, I've done that, I've done, uh, but what else can I, uh, 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 it's too much food. And, um, and so yeah, so now you're in a position where you can give that away to people and support other people and help other people and you know, maybe exchange that for things that you can't grow. And, um, and so yes, yeah, so yes, you put hard work in at the beginning. It's a lot of thinking, a lot of designing, a lot of learning about systems. A certain amount of work for a back gardener, say, if you spend five days, that's probably the maximum you'd need to convert a back garden uh, into a, a decent food growing system. And then a few days over the next years, the rest is just kind of maintenance and harvesting. So long term, it's really worth it. it, it it's you know, long term. It's not that much work for the amount of food that you get and the quality of food that you get as well. Because, because it's, it's what we call nutritionally dense foods. As opposed to most of the foods you buy in shops and supermarkets are more for bulk. They have very little nutrients, but they look big and they look good. They look nice because they've been sprayed and polished and pumped full of different chemicals and things. So they look good, but they're actually nutritionally very deficient. Whereas eating food that's growing in your own garden, which has been grown organically, uh, these foods are nutritionally dense, which means you only need to eat a small amount of those food to get the nutrients you actually need. So it's, you know, every way you look at it, you know, yeah, it, it's beneficial to everyone and everything. It's beneficial for your health, for you know, for nature, for surroundings, you know, for animals and insects, it, it just meets everyone's needs. Um, effectively, a buzzword that many people may have heard of these days because it started to get uh, popular is the term either food forest or forest gardening. And effectively what I'm doing is I'm, I'm designing forest gardens or food forests. And... Um, and which basically all we do is we look at how nature has produced food growing systems on her own and how does she maintain this rich space which let's face it you know in for thousands millions of years nature has always provided enough food for all of the animals and insects to thrive we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that so nature has found a way to produce food and um, but if we look at how nature typically does it in this temperate climate i.e the kind of european climate uh, it's typically very small maybe not even so tasty fruits so you know wild plums wild apples and things like that and uh, and lots of herbs and spices and medicines and things but uh, in terms of food and fruits it's typically much smaller more wild varieties so, and the limiting factor there is the nutrient cycle. You know, if a, a plant came in that was much more greedy, that needed more nutrients than its surroundings, it wouldn't survive for very long. So, because it just wouldn't be able to fruit, because it, there's so much competition for those nutrients. So, in a forest garden, all we do, if we recognise that the nutrient cycle is the limiting factor in this, is we then overstack, we design additional nutrients into the system so we look at where these nutrients could come from and they could either come from particular plants that are very good at mining or absorbing things from the air uh, so we overstack it from there or it could be the different animals that bring animals especially birds that bring nutrients into our system so we design that flow of nutrients the additional flow of nutrients into our system so that we can then have these bigger fruits growing and therefore, you know, actually, literally make it very, very, very low maintenance, high yield 
food growing systems. I'm sure this sounds very appealing to many listeners. I, I, I wanted to ask you, I, I'm, I'm sure I, I think I know the answer. Have you seen an increase in interest around permaculture over the last, say, five, seven years? For sure. And if so, why do you think so? Are, are we really reaching a point where we feel we feel so disconnected that we need to just take one solid step in the right direction? Good question. I'd like to go back one step just to finish off that conversation. I just thought that no I was once described as the uh, the most productive lazy hippie this person's ever met because I am essentially a very lazy person. But I put so much time and effort and work in a, into how to be lazy that that's, you know, so I, I design all these systems so that, the you know, so my food growing system, I put a lot of time and energy into designing a system that just works on its own so that I can then be lazy later on and not have to rely on making it work and, uh, and, and you know, not having to do the drudgery of continuous work to actually make the system keep growing food for me. So, yes, I'm the most pr productive, lazy hippie <laughs> this person's ever met. That's my tag. <laughs> I loved it. I love, yeah, it was really, uh, I like, I, I think I like that tag. Yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so essentially I'm, I'm lazy and I want my systems to do the work. I want nature to do the work for me rather than me having to do it. And I guess this also partly describes, you know, your second question, your actual question. Um, what I feel is a lot of, you know, because of the pandemic and Brexit and so many different things, you know, the, the system has been grinding people down, grinding people down, grinding people down, making them feel inferior, making them feel scared. And ultimately, this is how they gain power over people is by making you feel scared, whether it's through religion, whether it's through, um, you know, the education system. Uh, you know, supported by the media and films and all the rest of it, you know, we're continuously being made to feel inferior and, uh, and separated and isolated and disconnected from each other, disconnected from our surroundings. And this leads to a lot of fear in people. And, you know, and then obviously they use, you know, wars and all this, you know, all these um, immigration and, you know, all this kind of stuff to produce huge amounts of fear in people and then they can control you and then they can really control oh don't worry we will save you because we will bring this in we will bring this system in it's for your own good it's to protect you from this thing this external force that you should be afraid of and um and so if we recognize that as a pattern if we recognize that actually the main reason why we're so fearful is be, uh, is because we are separate we are we've been taught to be independent to be separate from each other and we must survive on our own but we don't have all the skills to do everything on our own so you know we don't have the skills to grow food we don't have the skills to make electricity so we're reliant on other people doing that for us and what if we don't earn enough money to actually be able to get those things and again more fear more fear more fear more fear because of this separation so people feel that you know and this obviously leads to you know I say we're pack animals and we want to be part of a group we want and we see because of the modern way of thinking uh, whenever people come together because of this kind of selfish mentality that we have been told and the survival of the fittest mentality that we've been told is the norm uh, we find it very difficult to actually be with other people without getting into arguments and without tension arising. And, um, and you know, we find it very difficult to accept other people have different ways of living and different ways of thinking. And somehow they are different to us, so they, we must be afraid of them. And we must somehow persuade them to be the same as us. And all this just creates this really toxic environment. For everyone and so once we recognize that and once we recognize that actually we're pack animals and we really do want to be together and it actually serves us now all of a sudden it means that we don't need to have all of the skills we don't need to you know because as part of our community if between us we have those skills we can take care of each other we can support each other 
So when someone is not well and they physically can't work, then other people can take care of the work that they need to do to support them and take care of the person until they're better and find them the herbs and the medicines to you know get them back to health again and so on and so forth. So I think so many people are so disillusioned with this system and you know all the fear mongering that's going on that many people are reacting they're looking for something different and in the way that I understand permaculture and I guess I should kind of qualify that I had an understanding of life before I learned about permaculture and when I actually studied permaculture finally got onto a course for me everything as I said before was just common sense and you know and in fact the, the the students said they learnt as much from me because of all the practical examples I gave of everything the teacher was talking about they learnt as much from me as they did from the teacher in fact the teacher came to me and said wow you should be teaching this because you know permaculture better than others but for me it was just because it was common sense so um yeah so because of this understanding of permaculture I found it really easy to 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 start implementing and teaching permaculture. Sorry, I've lost the thread of where I was going with this conversation now. Um, went off onto a little rabbit um, hole there. We, oh, I guess you're, you're tapping on into the the fact that people want something different. That people want to feel Thank like you. they're more connected to their environment, more connected to their food source, more connected to the people around them. And that that's probably why there's been such an increase in permaculture courses over the last while. One thing I wanted to ask Rakesh was, uh, I'm sure people would be interested in this, how, like in what role permaculture played in your own kind of healing I would ask because I know you, you've spoken to me um, several times and you talked about the difficulties of growing up in the UK in the 60s and 70s and I guess uh, I, think a lo I think a lot of people when they think of permaculture they think of like you know middle class white people that have the opportunity to get a gardener in and to put all these things in place and or for people to have a plot of land to potentially um, plant their own food. You know, a lot of people live in flats, apartments, a lot of people don't have that luxury. And I guess it would be nice for listeners to hear about what what role permaculture played in, in this aspect of your life. So I guess what permaculture gave as I say, so I grew up in a really rough, tough environment. I in fact, maybe I'll, I'd like to share something that I've almost never shared with anyone before. But as I grew up, well, actually, one part of it I think people probably know, which is that I've never really considered myself English. Because where I grew up, it was in a really racist environment. And, um, and so I always resisted. If anyone tries to call me English, I react badly. No, 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 no. I was born in England, but I'm not English. And the part that I've never really told people, but when I was young, uh, I actually used to support uh, Ireland football team and what have you because uh, uh, but at that, at that age I had no difference between the Republic of Ireland I didn't know there was a difference between the Republic I didn't understand why they had two teams but I supported both of them just because I loved the accent I loved the attitude I loved uh, the fact that they hated the British as well and sorry I shouldn't say that really um, because many of my friends, where I, went to, where I went to school, they were, you know, mostly English skinheads and, you know, which then ended up being neo-Nazi skinheads. And, but there were plenty of Irish people where I grew up. And I just loved their a attitude and energy and uh, we used to have a lot of fun. And um, So, yeah, and in those days, you know, you had Pat Jennings. I used to be a goalkeeper. So even though I was small, but on a five-a-side pitch, I was a really good goalkeeper. So Pat Jennings... Then you had Liam Brady, you had um, uh, so many, you know, I support, supported Arsenal in the end because of some of these players. And uh, yeah, so, so you know, I remember, well, yeah, I mean, so yeah, so I used to support Ireland as a football club back in the kind of uh, late 70s, early 80s and stuff like that. And, um, but yeah, so I, I had a tough upbringing uh not really feeling connected to this country at all and yeah so I grew up in in a poor part of London in in poverty uh, you know in a poor family and so we worked really hard to kind of get out of poverty I think I had my first 
holiday when I was something like 28, 29 years old. And, um, and so where permaculture reads, so, so I'd always been solving problems, you know. If, if something broke, we would fix it. If it was, you know, clothing, we'd stitch it back together again. If it was a furniture, we would reach, you know, we'd put it back together again. If it was electronic, I'd take it apart and try and understand how to fix it back and make it work again. And um, so we always had that attitude. Uh, we always had that, you know, which which is a permaculture, you know, is a, is a permaculture attitude. So I would say that I was always doing permaculture all my life anyway. But uh, what studying permaculture actually gave me is a really incredible framework and a really incredible set of tools to actually understand and really clearly build up these beneficial relationships. So it gave me a really good framework to understand what I was doing, why I was doing it, why it was good, and massively improve how I did make my designs. So, and one aspect of that is my mental, physical, and emotional side. Uh, so to be able to use the permaculture design process to actually interrogate to see, well, what is it, uh, what, is, what are the things that really enrich my mental well-being? I'm a Gemini, and so I love new challenges. I love new things. If you give if you give me a repetitive boring task, I will be i I'll be brain dead. I'm sorry, no, I just put variation in that so that every day I do it, it's slightly different. I'll do that again and again and again and again just to have these new experiences. So how to design that in? Um how to design this change, this variation, this excitement, this you know, so I love going to new places, new cultures, new foods and new environments this is this is what really stimulates so what are the things that really stimulate me mentally and keep me alive keep me alert keep me buzzing keep me really joyful um, what are the things that I need in for my own health to keep my my body working uh, at an optimal way so you know so part of it is about food but it's also you know if your mental health isn't good then that physically will also affect you. That will lead to an imbalance and tension in your body, which leads to physical pathology. So it's about understanding and really having the ability and the tools to delve in, to interrogate and see what's really going on. What are the things that really allow me to thrive in this world? You know, whether it's physically, mentally, spiritually, what am I already doing well in each of those areas? And therefore, what are, where are the things that I'm not doing so well? So what, what is it that I would like to do? All right, so maybe certain things you know you would like to do, but let's face it, there you're just not going to do them. You know, while you make make a New Year's resolution, yeah, I'll do this, I'll do that. The chances are, yeah, it's not going to last really. So instead, instead of trying to aim for something that you know is impossible, it's a nice dream, but it's just not really going to happen. Could I? be a little bit more creative and change it in such a way that um, when I do this I, I do it in a way that it kind of almost blends into my day so it's not a big it's not going so far out of my routine and I just need to add just one extra little step as I'm doing this and then all of a sudden it brings me this benefit so can I design that well-being into my life as opposed to just making a New Year's resolution. So one example was I I consider myself to be really rubbish at drawing uh, in arts and stuff. And um, so I'd really love to draw, be, learn how to draw better. Uh, I really love plants and there's many, many, many plants that I don't know. There's many plants that I do know, but there's many that I don't know anything about. So I'd love to learn more about different plant families. Uh, another area of something I wanted to improve on was my physical exercises. So I'd love to go cycling a lot more. I'd love to go to green places which are, um, you know, in nature so I can actually breathe some good air and so on and so forth. So there's a whole, and I love to be with people and I love to share things. So there were many, many, many things that I would love to do. So part of a design could be, and in this case is, was, and I am still doing, 
and I've got another one coming up next month uh, or at the end of this month is where we go for a bike ride with a group of people out into nature then we spend some time looking at wild plants and foraging for food and studying plants and we draw those plants and we teach each other we skill each other and then we cycle back and so pretty much it's you know it's fun i found a fun way where i can share some of my skills where i can harvest wild foods where i can get some exercise learn how to draw and as I say do it as a group do it as a and, and inspire other people also so this next one we're going to do i'm actually in the middle of physically building like a bike powered generator um and so at the end of the next run the next uh yeah cycle ride we'll then come back to a particular place where we'll make a bike powered cinema so at the end of it we'll actually have a little cinema um so i've literally yeah so this is a usb cinema with speaker which literally i've uh -huh. just got and so i'll connect this up to my bike powered system that i'm building downstairs right now and we'll show a little film and then have a discussion at the end of it so that's amazing it's all about stacking functions it's all about having fun and making doing things in a creative way and you know again it's about meeting your needs but in a way that's fun that engages other people connects with other people and you know enriches their lives as well mm. that's a great example Rakesh and uh, for anyone listening that might be near the London area we'll be sure to put in your contact details sure. in the show notes um, just before we go, Rakesh, um, I think we should mention your upcoming trip to the Emerald Isle. Yes, finally. I've, yeah. <laughs> I've, in all these years, I've travelled all over the world, but I've never, ever been to Ireland, ever. So this is my first time. I'm so excited. The land of Pat Jennings and Liam Brady and wow. <laughs> um, so yes, I'm really, really, really super excited. Uh, so yeah, we're going to be doing a permaculture design course uh, which will be part of it will be in December and for, so we'll spend six seven days together in in December and then another six seven days in January it's going to be in County Donegal apparently everyone tells me it's so beautiful up there and um, yeah, it's, it's beautiful every pretty every Irish listener will would have heard of Bundoran uh -huh. south of Donegal that's exactly where it is guys it's beautiful Wonderful. And so we're in a big house. We've got a big house to ourselves. And um, yeah, we'll be. So we'll. The way that I'll do it is these first seven days is really teaching people everything they need to know about, you know, or getting people started on the whole food growing and, you know, water management and, and various other things. But we'll actually start with a collaborative decision making day where we learn about how to work well together. And. In fact, for those who can't make the full thing, we'll have separate one day sessions and I can share the full details. But if my memory is correct, uh, the first Friday is going to be about collaborative decision making, sociocracy. So people are welcome to come to that as a one day session. The next day on the Saturday will be one day on the basics of permaculture. And so, again, people can come to that. And then I think think the next day is about water i need to check these days there's there's three four days which where people can come just to the one day alone and the other day one day session typically i will do is one day on designing forest gardens and there's a i think a one day on natural building and uh, so people can come to those individually or they can come to the full thing which is um and the way that i work is I recognise that everyone comes has a different financial, um, yeah, access to uh, different amounts of financial, yeah, different financial needs and uh, and different financial abilities, and so I recommend a kind of price range, but at the same time, if people can't pay within that, then it's not a problem. Just contact me, explain your situation in really simple terms. Please, no long paragraphs because I won't read it all, but just say that, yeah. I'm in this situation, but what I could afford is this. And I'll say, great, you're on, let's go. And um, 
I structure it in such a way that um, you know you pay for the accommodation separately but if you obviously you can make your own accommodation or if you can stay in your own van or something or you know whatever then again there's a, a you know that saves a certain amount of money uh, so people pay for accommodation separately and you can make arrangements with the venue uh, around that uh, people then pay me for my part of the workshop and then you as students organize the food and what that means is that you're not passive in this course you are an active you're actively contributing so we spend the first day looking at collaborative decision making and one of the decisions is how do we feed each other how do we make sure that everyone is fed throughout the course who pays for it how is it paid for where do we buy it from do we forage do we and these are decisions that you make collectively and then keep fine-tuning as the course goes along so by doing this many people have come to me and first of all the, the most obvious thing is they realize that actually it's in much 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 cheaper to do it this way than if they had paid uh, they'd everyone had just bought food you know someone else one person bought food for everybody uh, the food itself that you eat is so creative many people say they actually learn to cook for the first time ever on these courses and now they're loving it you know people are saying wow that's the first time I, I know how to cook but I've never cooked for 20 people before this is great other people you know so there, there's so many benefits to doing this so you get a really diversity of foods you get really creative but for me, the most important thing is just the, the, the kinship, the, the, the stories that are told, the connection that you make with your little team as you're cooking and when you're cooking. And these friendships last, you know, because when you do things together and if you make a, a disaster, you know, um, I remember one story where we um, someone was cooking uh, kidney beans and then we had to, we didn't have a kitchen, so we had to build our own stove. Um, and as he was cooking it, he just said to me, so how long do I need to cook this for? I said, well, how long did you soak it for? Oh, am I meant to soak kidney beans? Uh, yeah, at least overnight. Uh, and I said, well, are you cooking it for lunch today, dinner t today, or lunch tomorrow? So it's for lunch today. I said, you'd be lucky if it's ready by tomorrow, mate. Like, you know, you're going to be cooking that for about 10, 12 hours. So, um, so everyone then, when we all had a laugh about this, we all kicked in and we all made something to eat. But still, to this day, 10 years later, or eight years later, we are still laughing about this. You know, it brings so much joy. <laughs> everyone remembers that day when we, when we cooked kidney beans, you know, for 10 hours. It's, it's part of our story. It's part, many people make, you know, if you had paid someone to do the cooking for you and they've had this kind of disaster then it's a disaster and everyone walks away feeling oh. whereas we've turned it into something that's really joyful and you know because it's part of being part of a team it's being part of a group and solving problems together I can tell you another example of where we did one course uh, it was kind of October so it's getting October going into November in Bulgaria and as soon as we arrived I arrived a couple of days before uh, the what went first so first of all the electricity went out and uh, so we had no electricity then the water ran out and so we had no way of heating we had no way of cooking so and people were starting to arrive and there was like 26, 27, 28 people, something like that, arriving in this place. There was a few other things that went wrong as well, but I'll tell you that another day. Um, and the, the host was really desperate. Oh, no, we need to fix this. We need to fix that. We need to, you know, make it perfect before people arrive. I said, no, let people arrive. Let them see the difficulties that we have. Then it's our responsibility, our collective responsibility to fix this. And as people started arriving and we started talking about the different challenges we're going to have, people started, all right, so we can't use the toilets. Let's dig a ship pit. Who's up for digging a ship pit? Yep, good. Yep, three of us. Yep, let's go. Boom, done. All right, where do we get water from? Ah, oh, there's a spring just over there. It's, you know, it's 10 minutes walk, but carrying it back, 
could we maybe arrange a car to come and, you know, if we bring it up to the road, can someone drive it back? Okay, done, right, another job. Where do we get firewood? There's a huge forest everywhere, bang, firewood. And, you know, bit by bit by bit, everyone solved the problems. We solved it collectively. So we had no water, we had no <coughs> electricity, we had no sun, but, uh, we, you know, but, and it was cold, and yet we solved every problem collectively and for me this is one of the most magical courses and because you know we we do this so shocks we do the collaborative decision making at the beginning the point is that every day we fine tune things so when things are not working we look well how can we fine tune it and there were two people who well there were about four or five people who didn't speak any english whatsoever and i remember one of them he was an army man and he, uh, so, you know, kind of tough, very resilient. And uh, and uh, after two days, so at the end of the course, he then told us his story. He said, after two days, he said, I just wanted to leave. He said, the translation was so bad. You guys were laughing so much. I never had a clue why you were laughing because no one would explain that to me. I said, I didn't know half the time what was going on. And then I saw guys hugging guys, you know, like, <laughs> like no, nah, I'm out of here. I don't... But he said, but you know what? You guys, day by day by day, gave me so much love. He said, every day, as I expressed what was not working, you tried, everyone really tried hard to fix it, to fix and keep fixing everything that was not working for me. And he says, I have never felt so much love in my life. And this grown army man started to cry. He said, I've never felt so much love in my life. He said, why do you have to leave? Give me your passports. I'll burn them right now. Don't please don't go. <laughs> um, and yeah, and he and he set everyone else and everyone else then started to cry because it really made some magic. One of the other people I didn't know this almost to the end, but he was a police inspector. He came because his his wow. his wife forced him to come. He didn't speak a word of English, but we've got him on recorded singing. You know, someone was playing on a ukulele. Don't worry. Be permi. He's singing in English like this police inspector, <laughs> and it is so beautiful. So um, yes, yeah, so just this bringing together of people, coming together of people, is and in a really rich way is magic. This is what really enriches our lives. So that's why my course is designed the way it is. So we do it in two sections. First week, we then have a, a month gap where you can go away and start putting some of these things into practice. Then we'll come back again in January and we'll do the second part, which is where you make real designs and really make stuff happen. And um, and obviously, being a reggae DJ, we'll have a few little reggae parties along the way as well. And uh, who knows what else? Hopefully, we'll go and visit some other eco villages and stuff like that. And yeah, basically, we're just going to have lots of fun. I can speak from experience that uh, Rakesh's reggae reggae DJ skills are top notch. Um, <laughs> And I, I wish you the best of luck with the course. I'll, for anyone interested, I'll leave all the links to your to your page, to to your contact details, because I'd imagine there will be an interest after hearing you speak about, about this uh, new approach, I guess, a new approach, a, a new way of living. Absolutely. Um, thanks so much for your time, Akash. I know you're a busy man. My pleasure. And just to just to reiterate, if the price on there looks intimidating, is unrealistic for you please get in touch because it really I, I love to share this information and the money is not the important part so obviously you need to feed each other you know the host needs to be taken care of as well but uh but we can where there's a will there's a way so if this is something you're passionate to learn about please 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 get in touch and we'll find some way even if you have to pay installments for the next 12 months i don't care whatever it takes to get you on here whatever it takes to get you skilled up and excited and become part of the family that's that's more important to me than money so um yeah look forward to seeing as many of you as possible so let's make it happen let's have some fun thanks a million Rakesh. really appreciate it thank you very much you take care everyone lots yeah. of love and yeah. i'll see you soon ireland Whee! hi guys thank you for listening to the podcast please don't forget to subscribe and leave a five-star review if you haven't already Every review helps us climb the podcast charts so that even more of you can listen to our amazing guests. We really appreciate the support. Remember to tune in next week. But until then, keep safe and have a good one.